Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices um, or at least switch them to silent mode so they don't interfere with the work of the committee. Um, item one is a decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take item three in private? Thank you very much. Um, can I move us now to item two, and we're going to take evidence on the Auditor General's report on NHS workforce planning. And I welcome to the committee this morning, Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, Shirley Rogers, Director of Health Workforce and Strategic Change, and Catherine Calderwood, Chief Medical Officer, um, all from the Scottish Government. Could I invite an opening statement from Paul Gray? Thank you, Convener. I propose to just say very briefly that I'm grateful to the committee for the opportunity to present evidence today. Um, we will, uh, I trust, share the questions appropriately with, between myself and my colleagues. If there is anything to which we don't have uh, a factual answer, we'll seek to provide it as quickly as we can. Uh, and if there are any issues on which we uh, require to take further advice from other professionals, we'll do that and again uh, provide the evidence to the committee as quickly as we can. I really don't want to take up the committee's time with a long speech, so I'm happy to uh, hand to you, convener, for questioning. Thank you very much, Mr Gray. I mean, I wonder whether I could kick off, because last week, when I wasn't here, unfortunately, we heard from um, some of the witnesses that there appears to be no coherent plan in place. Um, if you were to kind of gauge the importance of having a coherent plan, you know, is it something that you would regard as kind of nice to have um, or absolutely essential? So I think I would like to begin by saying that there is a coherent plan. Um, we have already uh, published phase one or part one of that plan. There are two parts still to come. Uh, one already well forward in preparation and the other on the stocks. Uh, is it uh, nice to have or, or essential? It's essential. That's why we're doing it. We wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think it was essential. I think in the present context in which we operate, focusing on the essentials is important. Uh, can I therefore ask then, given that workforce planning decisions were made before um, and previous ministers um, have actually taken decisions um, to, to cut numbers or indeed increase numbers, um, on what basis did they do this if we're now only arriving at a comprehensive plan? Um, I'll ask Shirley Rogers to come in on that in a moment, but um, ministers in uh, different contexts and in different administrations would make their decisions based on the best advice they had at the time and in the context in which it was made. Uh, a decision made 5, 10 or 15 years ago would be different from one that might be made now. Um, there have been significant changes uh, over time. In, uh, I would offer three areas, although they're not meant to be um, exhaustive. Uh, the first is uh, changes in clinical practice. So, for example, uh, things are now done differently from how they were done 5, 10 or 15 years ago. Changes in our approach to multidisciplinary teams. So the spread of uh, work across different disciplines is different and we need to be planning for that. And thirdly, um, and I genuinely you know, don't want to, to pull us off onto this, but contextual issues such as Brexit, the decisions made there do have an impact on how you might plan for a future workforce if your stock of uh, people is likely to come from different sources. So all of these would, all of these considerations and many others would apply at the time at which decisions were made. If, if you had such good planning tools and such a, a positive approach to planning in the past, why then do we have such acute shortages? Because, you know, given that it takes 15 years to train a consultant, um, surely we should be horizon scanning in a way that allows for that and that we don't simply think in five-year bursts? So I think your point about thinking for the, not just for the medium, but for the long term is fair. I think that um, we have, as I say, seen changes in the way in which um, clinical practice is delivered, but there is also, a, it is a fact that in some specialties, and again, the Chief Medical Officer could speak to this, in some specialties there are worldwide shortages, so um, we have, we, you know, we're up against the same situations as other health systems in, in developed countries face. I don't say that's an excuse, but it is nonetheless 
um, a fact that in some specialties it is difficult to recruit um, beyond national boundaries and, and, and internationally. I, I also think that having come to the point of developing a comprehensive workforce plan, we are drawing together significant strands of work that have always been done. We are not inventing some great newness here, but what we are doing is bringing coherence to work that was always done um, perhaps on uh, more on a more narrow basis, and I think that's all to the good. The inclusion of the social care workforce in this plan, I think, is another important contextual difference from what might have been done in the past, and that's why we're working closely with, with COSLA and SOLAS and other partners uh, to make sure that we get that aspect of it right. I don't know whether you want um, either the Chief Medical Officer or, or um, the Director of Workforce and Strategy to say more about either of these issues. Um, I think we'll probably pick that up in questioning from other members. Colin Beattie. Hey, convener. For how long have you been working on a, a national workforce plan? Well, I'll ask Shirley to give you the detail, but I mean, in, in terms of what we have now, what we have now produced, we've been working on that for at least a year. I, 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 I'm happy to help you further if there's a more specific point that I can. The, I think the point I'm coming to is, this shouldn't be something new. I presume that the different boards and yourselves have been working on a, a national plan for some years, and I'm looking at uh, the document, the, the evidence that you. Uh, you gave to this committee and I'm struggling here to see anything other than jam tomorrow I mean there's nothing firm in here it's all things underway under active consultation cons being considered and we're going to recirculate guidance there's nothing firm here so there are, there are approximately 156,000 people working in the National Health Service in Scotland at the moment. And they came from somewhere. They came from the planning that we did. They are still coming from the planning that we did. Um, if we had, if, and we don't, if we had no plan, there would be no people. You, the, the, we, we don't... Universities don't train people on the basis of speculation that something might happen. So I accept that what we're doing is drawing together strands of work that we have always done, but I don't, I don't uh, accept that this is all jammed tomorrow. There are, there are doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, other allied health professionals working in the NHS in Scotland today because of the planning we did. So you say you're drawing together all these threads that already exist and that are already uh, giving you the information necessary for a national workforce plan. Is that correct? We are doing that. We're, we're augmenting it by, by further work that we're doing on data, for example. I know that the committee took evidence about data. That's an area where we know that we have some data. We have actually substantial amounts of data, but we need to improve the way that we draw that together uh, coordinate it and present it so that there is um, there is an improvement in my view in both the quality of the data and the transparency with which we present it so we're we're looking to improve I'm not disputing that there are things that can be improved but what I am saying is we are improving on the basis of work that we have already done I, I'm happy if Shirley wanted to give more detail on that well I think I'd like to refer back to last week, some of the evidence we received from the four NHS boards, and they gave a joint, uh, a joint uh, submission here, and it was pretty negative in terms of how this is going to work. And in fact, to quote from it, how this will be done is not yet clear, but it's believed that the new National Workforce Planning Group will provide leadership on how it can be done. I mean, they don't seem to have a, a terribly upbeat idea as to how all this is going to come together and I realize it's complex but if these very highly paid guys that are running the board don't know how to do it how's that going to work so I'll bring Shirley in in a second because we have made a determination to consult on the different 
chapters or phases of the plan as we have gone along. We are currently consulting on the second part. We are working with COSLA and SOLAS and others, as I've said. Then clearly, for, for if, if I was to ask any chief executive now, how will part two of this work exactly? The answer inevitably must be they can't know in full because it's not here yet. You can't know how something is going to work before it's here. So my view would be um, that we do have the, the necessary governance in place. We do have the necessary consultation in place. And if the feedback from chief executives is that they would like more clarity on how it's going to work, I think we'll be very happy to provide that. I have to say I'm uh, slightly concerned if senior chief executives are giving the impression that they don't do workforce planning. They do. I know these individuals. They do workforce planning. No, they didn't give the impression they weren't doing workforce planning. They were quite clearly saying they didn't see how it was all going to be brought together across the whole of the NHS. In other words, the, what I took from it was there's certainly workforce planning taking place within the different disciplines. How are you going to pull all that together at a national level to have a coherent national plan? These four... Uh, boards seem to be saying that they don't know how it's going to be done and they said boards plan using a bottom-up workforce planning approach extending this to involve partners across health social care etc will provide a cons will provide a more considerable uh, workforce plan but they say that there's all different tiers and everything here and they say they don't know how it's going to be done now is the national workforce planning group as they think or they believe to stay to their words, going to provide that leadership guidance that's going to take, a, take this forward? And if so, how? Well, indeed, and um, if it's acceptable, I'll invite Ms Rogers to give you the details of how that's going to happen. Thank you. So I should say I, I joined the NHS in Scotland nearly 22 years ago, and we've been workforce planning for at least as long as that, probably, probably longer. Where the workforce planning methodologies have been put in place, what we've been attempting to do over the last few while is to give boards and all of the other agencies who are required to come together to develop this plan uh, one methodology, a simple methodology. So if I cast the clock back to my early days in NHS Scotland, we probably did do that by specialty, and we certainly did that by board. And clearly members of the committee will understand that as we evolve our workforce planning approach those things are not going to cut the mustard going forward and haven't been for a little while so the workforce planning methodology that we have put in place the six step methodology which we put in place across nhs scotland we've now been working with colleagues across wider public services involved in the delivery of health care to share that methodology so we've got the same approach we know how to count the same things and just to give an indication of the breadth and complexity of that, part one of the workforce plan involved consultation with 79 different uh, stakeholder organisations who have a stake in this. So sharing that methodology, giving that leadership through the workforce planning group is a terribly important thing that we do, so that we're all doing the same kind of thing, and we can make modelling, scenario planning, and all the rest of it assumptions on the basis of that. The National Workforce Plan is different for three reasons, only one of which is about it being national. So the ambition, the scale of the ambition around the Workforce Plan was to do three things. The first was to bring that into a national picture, which we are, um, we've done with stage one and we will continue to do with our, with our methodology rolling it. The second was to look at, at workforce planning from the perspective of being multi-professional. So if I might just for the purposes of illustration say it's fine and dandy having enough surgeons but if you've got enough surgeons but you haven't got enough anaesthetists there's no good if you haven't got enough theatre staff you can have as many anaesthetists and surgeons as you like and so on to porters and cleaners and all of the other people that make up the health service so this is an attempt to do so in a multi-professional way which allows us to plan for scenarios around professions that are emerging so 22 years ago, the number of paramedics, for example, in Scotland was quite small in comparison to the number now. We can look at similar growth around things like emergency medicine and intensive care, where we've seen professions emerge and we've seen those require different relationships and different teams to make those services work. So the second thing, the second ambition of this plan, which I believe it's starting to do, and I can give some evidence if that would be helpful, is to take 
the health service and look at it from a how do teams need to be planned to work together and to deliver services in a multi-professional kind of way. And then the third ambition was that we increasingly recognise that health, the health of the population, is not simply delivered by the NHS. That in order to create and support people to be healthy and support people at home, we need to do that through a range of agencies. So the third element that is different around this, the ambitions of this plan is to make sure that we're not just looking at health in the traditional sense, but we're also looking at all of the services that supply, support, and help people to live at home, to get back into their, health, into their homes once they've emerged from hospital, and so on and so on. Final things that I think make this a little bit different for the first time now comprehensively we're considering the workforce not just in terms of the established workforce but also spending a good deal more time developing our understanding of the workforce in training and i think Ms. bailey you made the observation about the long-term nature of medical training it's really important that we understand what our supply pipeline looks like it's really important that we understand not just the numbers of that but the reasons why people make decisions so what is it that a student entering medical school is going to come out with at the other end, bearing in mind the long-term nature of foundation and specialty training? So this plan, the ambition of this plan, and we've already started to see the evidence around it, will allow us to look at not just the supply that we have now of our existing workforce, but also those people coming forward through training, what their choices are, not just in terms of whether or not they decided to stay and practice medicine in Scotland, but also how they choose their specialties, how we try and create the specialties that we need in a more attractive way to attract the kind of numbers. And the final thought, and forgive me giving a somewhat fulsome answer, but we can come back to any of it. The other thing that the Workforce Plan has allowed us to do is to look at the training ratios that we deploy in Scotland. So if I think back 20 years ago, if we needed a person, we needed a GP, we trained a, J a GP. That's no longer good enough because people make choices about how they want to work in Scotland. So they won't necessarily want to work full time, they won't necessarily want to stay in the same specialty for their whole career. So we're, in a, we're now in a position where we can nuance the training ratios and indeed in general practice we're now training two for every one that we think that we're going to need. To, to try and allow us to be sensitive to those things. So our ratios are not simply one for one across the piece. We have 1.4 ratios, we have 1.6 ratios, depending on the specialties, the shortages that we expect to have. It isn't finished yet. It's never, it, 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 I'm not going to sit here and say we've got everything that we would ever need to have. But we're a lot more mature now than we were, and we've got the foundation blocks in place that allow us to use the same methodology across the piece so that we at least understand the things that we're trying to move forward. What you're saying sounds good, but when I look at the joint submission from the four boards, they make it seem much more a raw work in progress with not a lot yet done to pull things together. And I wonder if, you know, there seems to be a, a gulf here between the confidence with which you're putting forward what seems to be logical ideas and what seems to be the consideration on the ground. And just to just to ask one other question on that particular piece, they say that t the, the Joint Submission says that work is underway to try and bring key workforce data together into a single platform. Now... What's the cost of that? I mean, a single platform to me suggests a major IT project and bringing together lots of different systems that are going to feed information into that. Is that the case? Is there a budget for this? Is there a time scale for this? How is it being managed? Yeah, I'm very happy to take that. I'm not surprised that the chief executives who gave evidence last week could, could identify a greater degree of maturity in some of the systems than in others. Some of the issues about planning a workforce across social care provision involves a great many of organisations, not all of whom are statutory partners. So getting the methodology in place isn't instant. It's, it's some, we're talking about some 
organisations that are very large, some organisations which are much smaller, some organisations that have specialist workforce planners, some organisations that don't. So sharing that methodology is a journey, and I'm not going to pretend that it isn't. In terms of your specific question around cost of platform, if I might just give a little bit of an explanation, people will understand that there are a number of ways that people enter the health workforce. So they will do so through medical training banks, GMC registers, NMC registers, midwifery training, a whole raft of different things. And some of those have different systems that have been built historically to achieve those things. The cost of the platform that we are expecting is, that, is actually that we will generate efficiencies from taking all of that information that is currently held in a plethora of different places and actually bringing that together and probably running the vast majority of that through, through NES and some of its established platforms. And the reason we're able to do that harks back to the point that I was making about starting workforce planning with people entering education into health. So into their medical education, into their nursing education, and building that platform from there. We've made some inroads into that already. We're using the Turas platform that, that NES have developed to do some of that for us. And we're getting ISD, ASD, and lots of other agencies working together to share data in a way that gives us a central place and to use that central platform to allow us to model. Why hasn't all this been done before? Because we're changing the way that we're doing workforce planning. NHS England have just announced that they're about to have a workforce plan, a national workforce plan, which I'm very pleased to see, um, because we are moving from a board-based approach to a properly nationally-based approach. And that's consistent with our approach uh, set out in the delivery plan, which was um, published in December 2016, where we are being very clear about what's being done nationally, regionally, locally, and in communities and at individual level. This is consistent with the direction of travel that we've adopted. But what you're saying is very significant. You're moving from a board-based to a national-based uh, workforce planning. So does that mean workforce planning is going to be centralised and t effectively taken away from the boards? No, it doesn't. And I mean, Shirley can say more about that. So some aspects of workforce planning have um, a national dynam dynamic to them. So the number of people entering medical school is something that we will always take a national view on. The number of people entering a particular specialty, we will look at that from a national perspective. Sometimes because those specialties have got very large numbers, sometimes because they've got very small numbers. And actually, it wouldn't do for each board to do an individual thing in that space. I go back to the point that I was making earlier on about the team dynamic. I suspect there is never going to be a likelihood that we will do national workforce planning for admin support in local board offices. But for those key critical professional groupings where there is funding or arrangements for their um, long-term education, be it nursing, midwifery, medicine, various other um, AHPs and um, medical scientists, for example, I think the notion of us doing that always on a local basis is probably not going to be a sustainable one. We need to do some things nationally, so the work that we've been doing around widening access to medical schools, for example, could never have been done on a board-by-board -board basis. It needed a Scotland-wide approach to be able to do that. But I think it would be wrong for us to conclude that there will be no activity at board level because there are some jobs that need to be workforce planned at local level because of the nature of that job. But also remember that workforce planning is part of a triangulation between service planning, financial planning, and workforce planning. So local decisions around where services happen will also be a big influencer around the workforce plan. Okay. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, just to start off, I, I'd like to direct a question to Mr Gray. Um, you have two roles, Mr Gray. You, you're an NHS Chief Executive and Director General in the Scottish Government. So I put the question to the boards last week. What, what do you see as your role uh, in terms or how you perform those two roles in relation to the boards? Are you uh, directive? Do you tell them how you'll be go uh, working going forward or is it much more consensual and collaborative? So um, I have two roles. I, actually, it, 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 I generally describe my job as having three, in fact. So if I can do that just to start and then answer your question. So I, I am 
a member of the Scottish Government's executive team, so I have a corporate responsibility with other Director Generals and the Permanent Secretary for the, for the corporate performance of the Scottish Government as a government department. I am, uh, as the Director General for Health and Social Care, the, the principal policy advisor to whoever is the Cabinet Secretary for Health um, of, all, of whatever administration. And as Chief Executive of the National Health Service, uh, I am responsible for delegating to the Chief Executives of the Health Boards uh, authority and responsibility to perform uh, the functions of these boards. So I am the accountable officer for the health budget and I delegate to those who are accountable um, the, the, the authority and responsibility to carry these matters out. Um, I'm assuming you're not asking me about my management style and preference, but rather about the, the governance arrangements that sit. Um, so the government, governance arrangements uh, at the top level would be that um, I have to satisfy myself that uh, the accountable officer for a health board is um, has the capability and capacity to carry out these functions uh, in order to make a proper delegation to them and I require therefore certain assurances annually about the um, delivery of uh, what has been delegated. Um, I have powers of intervention through the ladder of escalation which we have which has five steps on it. The fourth step would involve direct intervention by me. The fifth step involves direct intervention by the cabinet secretary or minister. Um, so I have, I have both a, a, I have a power of intervention. Um, I, in terms of how we go about things, it's always better to get people to agree to things than it is to impose them. But for example, on an issue such as junior doctors' hours, we reached a point at which I wrote to the chief executives of the health boards, uh, setting out what I expected. Um, at the start of my tenure, there was considerable use of what was called chief executive letters. These were letters of instruction. I have reduced that considerably. That was a, that was a, a decision I took simply on the basis that if one is uh, continuously instructing the health boards to do the, what to do this, that, and the other, then in effect you're you're removing from them a sense of responsibility for doing it. So I use these letters very sparingly. Um, I use them obviously to delegate uh, money and functions um, and in matters where, as I say, I, I think you've reached a point where you have to deliver an executive decision. But generally, I would prefer to. Uh, engage with the chief executives, the health boards, and the uh, medical directors, and the nurse directors, and others, um, on the basis that we would reach agreement about the best way to do things. But ultimately, I could, I can, and do decide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now, just to come to focus on the plan that Colin Beattie was exploring. Uh, so last week, it was made very clear. Uh, I asked the question, are you telling me there is no plan? And the answer was, there is no plan, uh, which I found terribly concerning. I, I then put the question to one of the chief executives, well, who's responsible? Who has failed here? And the answer I got was, all of us, from health board to government, have failed to pull together the link between short-term operational delivery and long-term workforce planning. Is that your view? Who has failed here, Mr Gray? No, it's not my view. I'm perfectly clear that in all things, I could always do better. I never take the view that, that I have reached some state of perfection where I couldn't improve. But um, as to saying that we've failed, I think, well, actually, Mr Kerr, out of respect for the, the those who gave evidence, let me not seek to interpret what they said. What they said is what they said. Let me tell you what I believe to be the case. We have already published part one of a workforce plan. We are developing part two of it and part three of it. That does not seem to me like failure. It would be perfectly legitimate for this committee and other commentators to say what they thought of the plan. I wouldn't object to that. It would be entirely proper. 
But to say that we've failed to produce one, I think, is, is simply not accurate. There is one. It's Let me visible. stop you there, if I may, Mr Gray, because that's, that's very much now. Yeah. Uh, and I will explore that in a second yeah. going forward. Uh, but what I'm interested in, it, Shirley Rogers talks about there's workforce planning been going on for 22 years, I think you said. Yeah. Uh, and yet we're sitting here. Uh, I used the word a crisis last week. Yeah. Um, we are sitting here apparently with a significant hole in the workforce which hasn't been planned for it would appear who's failed to plan nobody has failed to plan um and mr Kerr, it's easy for me to sit here and, no, and say nobody has failed and I, I i don't accept i don't i don't regard your question as unfair we have we are where we are because of as i said in response to the convener um changes in context, changes in demand, changes in the way that we do things, we have reached the conclusion, I think rightly, ministers reached the conclusion, that a national workforce plan was now necessary. That is what we are producing. If every time we produce something new, we describe the past as a failure, it's going to make it very hard to produce anything new. It's, there's not going to be much motivation to do it. Would you describe the past as a failure, given where we sit now? No, I would not. The patient satisfaction with the NHS is at 90%. That is not, to me, that is evidence of success. That is not evidence of failure. Uh, I'm just slightly struggling with that, given, as I think you know, I sit in the North East where we have significant workforce challenges. Uh, I, I accept what you say about the delivery, and I accept that there are, the people who are there are working very hard to ensure the level of delivery. But I cannot help but conclude that we are sitting with a depleted workforce because no one apparently has planned for it in the past. Am I unfair in concluding that? <laughs> Mr Kerr, it's never been my habit to describe committees as unfair, and I won't do it now. What, what I will do is say this, I, 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 and I want to bring Shirley in, if I may, in a second. I was at a conference um, uh, last week for general practitioners, which was um, run by Pulse magazine, and it happens every year in Scotland, and I was interviewed at it. Um, and I uh, spoke to an audience of, of about 270 general practitioners and their support staff and some patients. And I heard from a general practitioner that um, one of his colleagues, ha who is also a GP, had hurt her back. And because of concerns about workload and uh, about her own income, she was continuing to work, even although she was um, writing sick notes, as he put it, for people who were no more unwell than she was. So in other words, she was working in a condition where she was signing other people off. I'm not complacent about this. That's, uh, that, that's not how things should be. In some areas in general practice, it's very difficult to c recruit close to impossible. I accept that as a fact. I'm not pretending that it doesn't exist. I know that in the Highlands, and the Chief Medical Officer has been there recently and can say more as required, they're struggling to recruit into radiology. I accept that. However, if we describe that all as a failure of planning, that means that the whole world has failed to plan because there are, there are, there are recruitment pressures, as I say, in every health system in the developed world, and they're probably worse in the third world. We're sending people to help people in other countries where they, they have no supply at all. So I am not sitting here saying that, that there is some state of perfection in Scotland. There is not. But that's why we're doing what we're doing. And I, I, I hesitate, really, over, the conce over conceptualising it as failure. The example I would give is this. In 2014... Mr Gray, actually, what I'll do, if, if you don't mind, because oh, I think surely. it's perhaps more important, we do project forward now. So... It, it, uh, if I use words that I think have been used earlier, we are where we are. Uh, you are now trying to get a handle on it. And looking forward, and I posed the question last week, what if we're still sitting here in three years? So let me pose you the question, if I may. Who owns this process? Who's got the ball? 
and who will be sitting here in three years if it doesn't work? I'm the accountable officer. I've got the ball. And I'm happy to sit here, and I hope I will be sitting here in three years, because I believe I will have something good to give account of. I'm supported by the Director for Workforce and Strategy, the Chief Medical Officer, and many others in delivering this. But ultimately, I've got the ball, and I've never failed to accept that. Thank you. I appreciate the clear answer. Um, I have two brief questions, if I may, on a slightly different uh, tack, but the same sort of thing. Uh, we're obviously all very concerned about the future, um, and it, it is good to hear that uh, you're, you're intending to get it sorted. But tell me, what are the practical consequences, in your view, for both the staff and the patients? Uh, the, if the, the Attorney General uh, refers to, the Auditor General refers to urgent workforce challenges, if that isn't addressed, what do you see as the consequences if this doesn't work? I think the consequences would be bad, but can, can I make use of? May I make use of my colleagues and bring them in because I, I'd, I'd really like to draw on the senior expertise that I have here. Perhaps Shirley could say something about what we're doing, and then Catherine. Particularly, I think we should focus on 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 Mr. Kerr's question about about what we're doing and what consequences we are therefore seeking to avoid. Thank you. Um, I would be the first to recognise that there are some challenging recruitment circumstances across various parts of Scotland, and you're right to identify some of the issues around rurality, for example, and GP populations and so on. Just to put some um, some sense of, of, of our continued effort into that space, because I, I, what I wouldn't want to do, I, I've been very proud to work for the NHS for 22 years, it's something that's very important to me. And I'm not going to sit on our laurels and say, haven't we done well, when we know that there are big challenges ahead. So let's face those challenges. We currently sit with 96% fill rate on our specialty training posts for medicine in Scotland. That's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. But within that 96%, there's some great successes, but there's also some real challenging areas, and we know that. So our efforts around widening access into medical schools, our efforts into increasing um, the numbers going into nurse training and various other things that will try and in, in improve on that. There are some successes to point to. If I point to the track record of emergency medicine, which I mentioned earlier on, where we're seeing 192% increase in the establishment from 2006 to 2017. So we know that we can do this stuff. Paramedicine, so similar size growths in respect to the paramedic communities. We're looking at different models of how we provide care. That means that people, wherever they live in Scotland, whatever their health care needs, get that which is appropriate to them. We're working really hard as well on how people feel working for the NHS. So as the Director of Workforce, I don't spend my time just doing workforce planning. We also spend a lot of time looking at employee engagement, how people are feeling, how we support people in the workplace. When certain times difficulties, you know, times can be quite difficult, and, and I recognise that. So there's a lot of activity going on right now to make sure that the supply of our workforce is improved, that we look for different models, so things like physicians' associates, for example, which are being used to great effect in Grampian. Um, to address some of the issues there, look at to see whether or not there's greater scope to roll out those kinds of initiatives. But continuing to focus on rurality, you, you may have seen, um, Mr Kerr, that there was a, an award made to Ab Aberdeen University yesterday for the exposure that it's giving its, to its medical students to rurality. And we've been working very hard in the area of <coughs> rural practice to try and make sure that people who work in rural Scotland feel supported, have good, appropriate educational links, the ability to recruit into rural Scotland we know is enhanced when people feel that there's a, an opportunity to continue to develop their clinical practice through academic links and so on. So Explore, Shirley, just on the recruitment. Forgive me, because mm. uh, I'm just aware my colleagues wish to come in. I just have one question on recruitment specifically. Uh, the Auditor General notes a 6.3% increase in overall NHS staff levels. Uh, since 2012, uh, and in about the same time, an 11% real terms increase in staff costs. Uh, but the report then goes on to suggest that there's not always a, a clear link between staff shortages and the outputs, the service delivery. So has there been a formal assessment of 
the relationship between increase in staff levels, increase in staff costs, and the actual outcomes delivered by the NHS? It's a very fair question, and I, I think it's fair to say that one of the things that we're working on now is that notion of productivity and outcome. Um, you will have seen some of the reports that were published yesterday where the um, BBC was making commentary around that dimension in England, and there's work starting there now to, to look at that very, that very same issue. So, put bluntly, does the growth and does the growth in cost generate a commensurate improvement in health? Um, for, for certain things, we have the foothills of some evidence that would suggest that there is a relationship. For other things, there is still a sense that greater efficiencies and the way that people work together in providing appropriate community solutions, for example, might be um, a, an investment in community staff that overall would have a, an improvement on our financial position because people are not being admitted to hospital. So the short answer to your question is I don't have it yet. The longer answer to your question is we're on it and we will have it over the next wee while. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Willie Coffey. Mr. Convener, um, could I just start off and I hope as a positive note, I mean, we know there are more staff in the NHS, there's more doctors, there's more nurses, there's more consultants. In fact, there's nearly 3,000 more GPs in the service than there were, say, 10 years ago. And the public satisfaction that you've mentioned, Mr. Gray, is very, very high. The NHS in Scotland is highly regarded and it seems to be performing the best of all the UK NHS services. So, I'd like to put that on the record. It's a very strong positive. However, there are many issues that do face the service. And as we all know, I'm interested to get your views on the whole bigger picture about service redesign and what that might look like over the next few years. We know there are pressures in GP practices. We know that's influenced by the pensions issue, early retirals and so on. We know the A&E service is under pressure, despite it, it's performing very well, but it's under pressure. And when we know that there are spiralling costs in the agency and locum costs and so on. What are we doing in these three key areas that I think the public would expect to see some progress on in the next few years to try to manage and improve those aspects of the service? So what you're asking me about about service redesign, about pressure on staffing, you've mentioned A and E in general practice, yeah. and you've asked me about agency and locum costs. These are yeah. the three things yeah. to cover. So um what I might do is ask the Chief Medical Officer to say something about, about clinical staffing and what we're doing about that. Um, I'll say a little about service redesign uh, and I'll ask Shirley to pick that up further in the context of transformation. Shirley chairs the Transformation Delivery Board and locum costs. Again, Shirley will, will give further detail. I think on, on service redesign, Mr Coffey, I mean, Let's all have in our minds, first of all, that we are already uh, implementing uh, the, the legislation uh, which paved the way for the integration of health and social care. So we are already doing that. It is, um, I think it would be fair to say, it is more advanced in some places than others. I would be the first to say that. But there are some successes to draw on. The reason I spoke earlier about looking at um, what we do nationally, regionally, locally, in communities and individually is because that r really our service redesign has to be coherent around that. Moving the focus from, um, if you like, uh, hospitals and and estate. So in other words, if 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 what you if ha your view of the health service is largely informed by hospitals and practices and offices, I want that view to turn right round so that it starts with the individual. Our design of our services is focused on more people living longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting because that, that remains our strategy. Why, why this local, regional, national piece matters so much is that if we are patchy in the way that we do that, if we're in, unclear or incoherent, we end up doing things either twice or not at all. So if I give one regional example, um, in the north, uh, in sorry, in the southwest of Scotland, um, one of the things, as in all other areas, that, that we have to be ready to deal with over weekends when there are um, fewer staff on, on duty um, is gastrointestinal bleeds. Now, if that happens over a weekend and you are in Lanarkshire, 
Ayrshire and Arran or Dumfries and Galloway, there is pressure on, on, on the number of doctors available to deal with that. That, that a regional solution is what makes sense there. Otherwise, you end up with recruiting enough doctors for most of them to stand idle most of the time, rather than dealing with the emergency or, or being short because one board has enough and the other two don't. So the three chief executives there have been working on designing a system that means that that service is provided regionally because that's the most not just the most efficient and cost-effective way of doing it, but because it's the way that actually delivers the best service to patients. Now, I'm going to stick at that one example. There could be many. But in terms of service redesign, it needs to be focused on, on the patient, not on the provider. And, um, say, integration of health and social care is, is proceeding. The other and last point I will make before handing over to the Chief Medical Officer is that <clears throat> engaging the public in service redesign is utterly fundamental. It can be the best service redesign in the world, but if the first time the public hear about it is when you close one thing and open another thing, you know very well what is going to happen as a result of that. Um, we will do things that people won't like. I, I, I'd rather hesitate to say that, but not because they're bad or ill-conceived, or misjudged, but if people are used to a service being delivered in a particular way, the prospect of change is hard. We have a responsibility to make sure that these changes are properly understood and a proper clinical buy-in. We, we owe that to the public. Dr. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think that one of the issues about pressures, particularly if we start with A&E, is, is very well illustrated, and it brings us back to Mr Beatty's questioning and Mr Kerr's questioning about, about the past and then looking for the future. Mr Neil will remember the time that the Royal College of Emergency Medicine came forward with a really um, difficult, challenging workforce crisis. But when we look at that time, what was happening there, and this is where the complexity and also the dynamic change of how our services run plays through, the demand in A&E was increasing. People were doing traditional on-call rotas. There were consultants available only for the most severe cases. And we were also having A&E used in a very different way than it is now. People were not signposted to other areas. But what we then did was added a four-hour waiting time target to a pressurised system, which then, I think, led to the... the, the the senior decision-making part of the team, the consultants really saying there aren't enough of us. And as Surly has said, that consultant workforce has almost doubled in that seven, eight, nine-year period. And so that's, a, that's a, a system that is changing according to the demands and the pressures on it. But that system needs to continue to change. And there are examples across Scotland of, of where the signposting in A&E is, is better than others. So there are mu there's much less demand. There's more direct access via general practitioners so that the, the emergency medicine doctors are using, used only for emergency cases. And there are also different ways of working where the senior decision maker is triaging at the front door and preventing admissions. There are also areas of Scotland where there's a team at the, at the front door who are able to discharge directly back to home for an, a frail elderly person who's perhaps fallen. They will take a physiotherapist with them. There'll be an occupational therapist there to assess them. And it, traditionally, those people would have come in, been admitted, and, and of course, that's not the right thing for that person, but it's also increasing pressure on the system. So part of our plan is, is looking at these different ways of working, but also taking into account what we now know to be better for people and the way that we're, we're treating them is actually better overall for outcomes. And I, 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 I won't assume, but some of you may have read my, or heard of my Realistic Medicine Chief Medical Officer's report. And what that has talked about is that some of what we do is, is over-medicalising and over-treating people. And in fact, what we've had the reaction not only from, from doctors, but from all of the, the, the healthcare professionals and the public is that people are saying, actually, we realise that we don't always have to see a doctor. 
They don't always have to come to be admitted. Uh, to, to ha uh, w there are alternatives, and in fact, much of the evidence is, particularly if I take the biggest um, group of, of conditions that GPs see, musculoskeletal conditions, about 40% of GP workload, they have, in fact, often a better outcome from seeing a physiotherapist. The GP is not necessarily the expert. Orthopaedic surgeons tell me that, in fact, with physiotherapy and rest, many of these conditions don't need any medical intervention. So to our GP workforce pressures, while I would absolutely agree that, that they are there and recruitment and retention is very difficult, what we're, what we're doing is responding to changing needs to also looking at evidence for what is going to provide the best outcomes for people. And that traditional model of, of, of doctor doing something it is no longer the right thing to do. So GP practice is not just about recruiting more GPs. It's about looking at that staff mix. It's about looking at what, in fact, the, 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 the right type of, practice, of professional is for that problem and doing that in a much more systematic way. Uh, the GPs are welcoming this. I've been to speak to groups of GPs recently. They're obviously under pressure and what they do tell me all the time is that they don't have enough time. So what I would like to see is that that, that general practitioner who is a, a generalist, an expert generalist with a medical degree, is only seeing the people they are going to make a difference to. They're only seeing the people that they are, 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 are the right practitioner for with their medical background. What the GPs tell me, though, is that that means they're going to get the difficult and complex patients. And sometimes in a busy clinic, it's quite nice to have something that takes two minutes or five minutes and lets them catch up. So we're, we're, there are unintended consequences of that, but of course what we must do is, is the right thing to do for the, for the people of Scotland. I, I think that um, that re-examination of our traditional way of treating people is fundamental to all of this, and, and so far with the reaction to realistic medicine, the public agree. The transformation aspects and then move into your question about bank and agency, yep. if, if that's Please, okay. Yep. If I can pick up the transformation stuff, the DG has also already talked about national, regional, um, local activity, and I, I wanted to pick up a, a, f a few things that I think are really important in the work that we're taking forward around that. Um, the whole thrust of our transformational strategy is to try and support locals and local people and communities, individuals and communities, to get what they need, where they need it, and where it makes most sense for them. So some of the activities around regional activity, it's interesting that the chief executives that you saw last week were all of the regional leads for this work, is about doing the things sensibly at a regional level that should be done at a regional level to allow those local things to get on with what they're doing and provide services. Some of that gives us an opportunity to try and reduce some of the harmful variation that we see. Some of that gives us an opportunity to roll out quickly um, and with some consistency, some good practice where we find it into a larger, um, a larger platform. Some of the things that we're thoughtful of, we heard evidence yesterday, I was hearing some evidence yesterday about the fact that one in four now of the cases treated by the Scottish Ambulance Service has a mental health dimension. That's something that was not even, I'm not even sure if it was recorded 20 years ago. Um, so we're looking again at how we train people to deal with the reality of the cases and the complexity of the patients that they are now seeing. And that's requiring us to go beyond those traditional boundaries and look again at things like mental health first aid. In fact, we were hearing yesterday, I think of approximately 16,000, if I remember rightly, um, Scottish Police Service individuals who have been given mental health awareness training. So, you know, a different landscape, a different training. We need to embrace technology. So some of the service transformation that is taking place will actually be invisible to, to anybody. Things like where we read a radiology film. The technology exists to now allow us to do that wherever and use capacity. So you'll see increasingly in the east of Scotland a relationship developing between Fife, Lothian and the borders, using capacity there to be able to read technology films because it doesn't actually matter where you are, it's the film that you're seeing. So um, that, that, that enhanced use of technology. And then finally some thoughts around innovation. 
because I think if we are genuinely to make um, our best efforts to make the NHS sustainable going forward, then there is a great deal of innovation that we are seeing and we need to promulgate. And an example I'll give of that is of a consultant working in a district general hospital. She was a gynaecologist who discovered that women who um, came to her, um, unless they were diagnosed with something very, very serious, seldom came back for their second appointment. And she did the um, brave and unusual thing of ringing up her patients and saying, why not? Why don't you come in? And they said, because it takes ages to get there. It costs a lot of money. We haven't got very good childcare, and it's all very difficult. And if it's not terribly serious, we'll kind of live with it. So she did two fantastic things. The first thing that she did was to front load that first appointment with everything that she thought was likely to be needed so that people didn't need to come back. And then even, even better, she went out to primary care and worked with GPs and nurses to make sure that the basic procedures that could be done and had previously been done in the district general were done in the GP clinic in their own home, um, close to their own home. So our transformation agenda is not simply about saying, you know, the public has got to, it's not about saying the public has got to change its ways specifically around some of the things that Catherine picked up. It's not in realistic medicine. It's not just about that. It's about saying um, the, the NHS going forward will use greater technology, will use more innovation to support people to deal with the issues as they see them. You asked specifically about bank and agency, and I, I'm going to start by saying to the committee, which something which I know that you already know, is that bank and agency spend is, is high. It exists because the primary objective of the NHS is to ensure patient safety. So board chief executives do not necessarily rush to spend on bank and agency staff, but they would rather do that than try and run a service that is not safe for the patient. Uh, I just want to say that none of that means that we are content with the amount of money being spent on bank and agency. So I wanted to just share with you some things that have been done very recently in, in, in over the last year to try and make sure that that position is improved. And, and I can um, say that in the uh, first six months of this year, that position is improved over the first six months of last year. Um, the, the data, depending on where you select it from, is, is, is slightly variable depending on whether or not you include all sorts of on costs and VAT and various other bits and pieces, but I think we would all acknowledge that it's too high. So um, the first thing that's been done is a refresh of the NHS Scotland National Framework contract. The contract was renewed this year for medical staff with the number of suppliers rising from 10 to 35, meaning that 80% of medical locum should now come through that contract. That means that there's a standard rate, that means there's a greater degree of consistency and hopefully some efficiencies in respect of that. Um, you will have seen in, that in England, um, the consideration was given to a capped rate in terms of um, trying to address how much money is paid to agency um, workers. We haven't gone for capped rates yet because of the patient safety issues that I talked about earlier on, but we are trying to ensure that there is a standard rate for the NHS in Scotland. In respect to the staff bank, which of course is, is, is a little bit different, we now have over 35,000 nurses in Scotland registered on the staff bank and some 2,800 doctors registered on the staff bank. So we all recognise that agency spend, bank spend is, is, is higher than we would wish it to be. Um, using the MASNET network, which I think the Chief Execs gave some evidence about last week, which is the, the Managed Agency Service Network, um, we are now seeing accurate reporting on the spend and, um, and we're trying to reduce that spend um, quite significantly. And as I said earlier on, the first six months that I've seen for this year are um, an improved position on the first six months of last year. That, those were very long answers, but very uh, welcome. Thank you for that. But could I, could I just ask you about um, a particular issue in GP practices? And last week I had the opportunity to say to the committee, and there are people giving evidence that one of the surgeries in my constituency had about 13,000 patients, 2,000 of whom come there every week. So on average, they're coming back again every six or seven weeks, every single one of them. Paul, well, in terms of reaching out to the public and taking them with us in this journey, this service redesign journey, how, how successful do you feel that is being, given we're seeing something like that? That's causing huge pressure in the surgery, many of whom 
as, as you said, Dr. Caldwell, would probably don't need to be seen by their, their GP. How do we manage the expectation that the public have that they are entitled to see their GP when they come into the, the surgery and demand that they do so? There, there are a huge number of other qualified staff available to see them, but the evidence on the ground is that big numbers of patients are still coming in every six or so weeks to see their GP. I'll ask Dr Calderwood to, to pick that up. That there's one thing that I just want to say, um, uh, Mr Coffey. We, we talk sometimes about inappropriate attendance. It's not a phrase I particularly like. I don't want people to think that it's inappropriate to access the National Health Service. Um, if they have a need and it's one that we can meet, we, we ought to be willing to meet it. So... Um, I say I'll hand over to Dr. Calderwood, but I really would I, I really would like to uh, place on record the importance I attach to um, not doing anything that would discourage people from seeking treatment or care or advice when they need it. So about getting them the right yeah. treatment, isn't it? The appropriate treatment. Uh, and so uh, uh, one of the deep end practices in Drumchapel came to see me for an, um, a meeting. It was there a part of their away day for the year, which I, I thought was quite an interesting way to spend an afternoon. They had played tennis the previous year, but they were telling me about uh, their um, people, exactly as you're describing, who were coming very frequently. And they, they examined very closely why these people were attending. And uh, as with many things like this, there's, there's often a pattern. So that, as Paul has said, it wasn't that the people were perhaps attending inappropriately, but it, it wasn't perhaps the GP they needed to see. They put in some dedicated healthcare assistant time. She goes to visit these people at home, in fact, as frequently as needed, and that's sometimes once a week, it may be less than that. They, they, they did a whole series of, of interventions into medication, into uh, being ability to get out and about and in fact those they have really cut down on on people coming to attend when they are seen if they do need to be seen by the GP the healthcare assistant flags that up so that's obviously somebody who has she spoke very emotionally actually about how she has then got to know these people really well and actually she can often deal with something over the phone and and they were they were in part needing help of some sort and to an extent what do we do is we only the only person you can book an appointment to see is the gp so we provide something without see, really asking that person what they actually need and so innovative ideas like that which aren't difficult they're in fact much less costly than paying more gp time uh, those are the sort of things we need to be considering having on offer um, in, all, in in GP practices. Mm. Is that issue in the plan and do you expect to see an improvement in that? Those kind of stats that are coming out over the next few years so that we won't see things like 2,000 or so people feeling that they have to see their GP every week? Yeah, speak is that... Because yeah. we heard different examples uh, last week in Evans that different approaches and triaging and different surgeries approaches that seem to manage the problem reasonably well. Will we expect to see that right across Scotland and a different approach to, to try and help this problem? So we're, we're talking about this much more generally. We're, we're building in these other types of people being part of the GP team. I, I don't think it's, this isn't immediate because some of this is, is, is needing to spread both across the general practitioners but also, as you've alluded to, the people who are coming to be seen, I would see that we, we would see a difference in uh, maybe a, a few years. We're already seeing some of the, the realistic medicine um, making a difference with people asking for interventions or rather not wanting as many interventions. Okay. Many thanks for all of that. Thank you. Okay, I wonder whether I could just, you know, because I don't want us to run out of time, so if we could all be crisper, that, that would be really helpful. Um, let, let me just quote to you from paragraph five of the Auditor General's report, where it says the recently published National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan Part 1 is a broad framework to consider future workforce planning challenges and not a detailed plan to address Im immediate and future issues. So as I'm listening to you and I'm hearing about these worldwide shortages, I'm looking at that and saying, actually, what you've published so far doesn't do the business. Is that fair? 
So I, I think, first of all, to say that um, if you don't have a strategic framework, then your prospects of achieving anything are, 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 are greatly reduced. I'll ask Shirley to say a bit more. Convener, I, I don't want to divert at all, but could you give me some guidance on time? When would, when would you like to be finished, just so that we're aiming for well, that? Don't, don't, don't worry, I'll worry about that. That's okay. my job. You can worry about the NHS, I'll worry about the All right, thank you. It was just to try and moderate our <laughs> responses appropriately. I'll do that for you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I do think we need a framework, but I, as I was seeking to make clear earlier, that doesn't mean we've stopped doing all the other planning that we're doing. We haven't suspended everything else and now we're going to do this. So there is already planning in place, which is producing... Um, you know, health professionals, let, let me not give you a list, but Shirley, do you want to say more about the detail? Absolutely. The, the, the planning processes to give us a sustainable supply of people to work in the NHS is, is never a, 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 a stop thing. You, you do it, you review it, you see what you get, you do more. And, and you do some things less and some things more. So if I take some of the areas where there is an acknowledged shortage, so general practice is, is, a, is a good example of that. Some of the work around um, trying to find a more sustainable supply of general practitioners involves, for example, the opening this coming year of the first postgraduate medical course in Scotland. Um, we've never had a postgraduate medical degree course in Scotland before. Um, we're doing that partly because we want to give people the opportunity to practice medicine, but partly because we believe that doing medicine as a postgraduate basis is more likely to give us people who want to practice medicine in Scotland because they will be more mature in their life choices at that point, but also because we've seen evidence in other places that postgraduate medical courses appropriately designed, which this one will be, um, help to direct and encourage people towards general practice, for example. So there's a good evidence if we could take a comparison with Keele University, which is the university medical school in England, which produces one of the higher proportions of general practitioners, and it does that by giving exposure. So does, does it give us everything that we need? No. Does it start to give us the people that we need to see coming through the supply pipeline? Yes, it does. The, the, the point you make about a framework is a very valid point, but remember as well that every year I get from the boards 22 plans, workforce plans. They clearly haven't worked, which is why having a single plan is something you accept is important. Mm. The first part of it was about the NHS workforce, so I would have expected to see detail there, and according to Audit Scotland, it's not. It's not there. So we naturally have concerns about the efficacy of this moving forward. Anyway, I've, I've taken up enough time. Um, Bill Bowman. Well, thank you, my convener. Good morning. Um, I, we've perhaps touched on this um, so far a little bit, but in terms of NHS Scotland, what, what is the chain of command? So um, I'm accountable to the Parliament and uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, of the day is the uh, responsible minister. Um, I am also accountable to the Permanent Secretary. She's my line manager. The, uh, as I've explained, the Chief Executives are delegated authority by me. The chairs of the NHS boards are appointed by the Cabinet Secretary, as are the members. I appraise the chairs of the larger boards, uh, directors who report to me appraise some of the other, uh, appraise the other chairs. Each chair is appraised on their uh, performance consistent with the standards set by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. Um, so the responsibility for the total budget rests with me as, as an official uh, and with the Cabinet Secretary as, as, as the Minister. So how does it work in day-to-day -day executive terms? So in day-to-day -day executive terms, when I have delegated to the NHS chief executives uh, and hence put that delegation within the scope of their board, the expectation is that the executive decisions at board level will be made at board level. That's otherwise that you know there is no system of delegation. I also have uh, directors who report to me uh, 
Shirley Rogers and Catherine Calder we are two of these, so I'm, the, I'm their line manager. I'm the line manager for the members of the Health and Social Care Management Board. So how do you, if you put this way, work that in the sense of we had um, chief executives here last week who were saying, as has been repeated, there is no plan. You say something else. I mean, it, something doesn't seem to work in the way you delegate. So, <clears throat> trying to find a way to answer this, which is useful to the committee. I think it is reasonable that the people who are closest to the preparation of the plan will know most about it. I think I have said, and I, it remains my view, to say that there is no plan uh, is not accurate. I think one of those who said something along these lines was Mr Davidson, who, who then went on to say that what he meant was that there was no single plan for everything. Well, that, that is true. But then that's not what we're here to discuss today, as I understand it. We're here to discuss the fact that there is a workforce plan. The first part of it has been uh, published. The second and third parts are in development. I'm not sure how one could conclude from what was said that the delegation hasn't worked. Well, how does the delegation work? We had, um, I mean, I read the documentation you've provided mm. and it, it seems to be sort of passive. We give guidance, we um, suggest how they do things. It's not as if you, as a chief executive, and maybe I'm thinking of other organisations where the chief executive make sure what happens, what he wants to happen, happens. So each um, board has a local delivery plan that they're held to account for that. I have, I have a whole team that does that. Um, as I've explained to Mr Kerr, if a point is reached at which I feel I need to make a decision direct and give a direction, I can do that. If I need to intervene, I can do that. But if, so, sorry, I'll stop there. I, I, I want to understand your question. I just get the feeling that the delegation happens, done. Well, no, definitely not. I mean, I meet the chief executives in plenary uh, once a month. I meet them individually uh, more regularly than that. Um, I don't meet every chief executive individually every month. I don't want to try to convey that impression. Um, the Health and Social Care Management Report, uh, Board receives reports monthly on financial performance, on workforce, on, uh, on delivery, in other words, access targets. No, we do not uh, hand over a delegation and then sit and wait to see what happens. That, that, that it is subject to regular monitoring, which is reported on. There is a health uh, and social care um, an audit group that meets quarterly so I mean I'm happy to provide I mean, I'm happy to say all that now and go into much more detail now if you wish or to provide you that detail in writing. I think we'd be happy to have that detail in writing. I wonder whether I might intervene at this point because you know we, I'm, I'm hearing a lot from you about different planning groups and all the rest of it but you know the Auditor General was absolutely clear. Current lines of responsibility and decision making unclear. Regional workforce planning not working as originally expected. There have been misunderstandings around workforce planning. And let me quote from Tim Davidson when asked who is responsible. He said, all of us, from health board to government, have failed to pull together the link between short-term operational delivery and longer-term workforce planning. Isn't that actually the case? No, I don't agree. I don't... I don't disagree, as I said earlier, convener, that there are things that we could have done better, but that's why we're doing now what we are doing. I am happy that each chief executive accepts responsibility in line with what Mr Bowman's been asking, but I don't agree that there, that there has been some collective failure to plan for anything. As I pointed out, we have 156,000 staff in the health service. We have them organised to deliver and we didn't get that from nowhere. So is the Auditor General wrong in her comments in her report? The Auditor General is commenting, I think, and she is proper to do so, on the sufficiency of what we have. We're still working on it. Nobody's denying that. But I'm not, I am not agreeing 
that there has been some kind of general failure to plan for a workforce. We have a workforce. It's here. It exists. But there's not enough of them, and they're not in the right place or the right skills mix. There are enough of them in some places. There are not enough in others, and I've been open about that. Sorry, Bill Bowman, did you have any further questions? <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, well, if we just set that aside, could I ask one other question, just to follow up on something else you said? Um, you had been listening to some general practitioners, I think you said recently, but by chance, I was also at an event last week where a senior GP, and maybe um, Dr. Calderwood could um, comment if she's perhaps closer to them, who in a number of ways pointed to the good things, but comment that I remembered there was a lack of joined up thinking in the NHS. Does that strike a chord? I, I think that we would say now that that, that, tr that primary and secondary joining up, in fact, interestingly, probably many decades ago when there were individuals who knew each other, both in primary care and into secondary care. And, and as the, the numbers have expanded of, of I'll, I'll take it, you're talking about doctors at the moment, ironically, those good relationships have probably been less good. We have uh, other initiatives, and, and a very good one, I will be brief, in Highland has been a, a very, uh, difficult numbers of people coming through for the urology department to cope with. They again took this attitude that let's have a senior person look at this. Again, that's not traditional. Usually the senior person only looks in at the, at the, the end or at the most difficult stage. And in fact, he as the senior urologist was able to say, well, lots of these people don't actually need to see a urologist. But what he recognised was that they needed some, some help. The GP wasn't just sending them for the sake of it. So actually what they've done in Highland is they've gone out to the GPs, they've gone out with, with teaching and, and discussion to say, if this is what this person has wrong with them, why don't you try this, this and this first? That's what I would have told you if you'd waited for uh, 12 weeks and come up to the hospital to my clinic. So that relationship needs to be built again. In the, in, in the past, perhaps the GP would have lifted the phone and now that isn't the way that there isn't access like that. So we're looking actually in the, in the new collaborative, which is looking at, at different ways of working with outpatients, at reintroducing that sort of service where there are uh, people in secondary care with expertise, where the, the GP is able to phone for advice. And I think that will rejoin some of that uh, disjointed service that you're talking about. Thank you. Hard to beat the, per the personal touch. And the telephone. OK, Thank Alex you. Neil. Can I just begin with a, a factual question, and that is, what is the current status of Harry Burns' report on waiting times, which obviously impacts on what we're talking about? I understand <coughs> we expect to have that published shortly um, next week. Yeah, uh, yes, but I'm soon. Uh, right. Before yes. Christmas, anyway? Yes. yes. Right. Okay, because that'll be interesting, because that, I think, has potential impact, obviously, in workforce. Can I begin by kind of focusing in on the primary care, particularly GP practices. Um, first of all, again, a short factual question. What is the current status of the negotiations on the new GP contract in Scotland and when do you expect the new contract to be in place? I expect the contract to be published next week for consultation. Uh, clearly, when it's in place depends on the consultation. Okay. Obviously, the shortage of GPs um, is an immediate issue um, <coughs> and <coughs> requires, obviously, imaginative approaches. I, and I appreciate the um, initiatives that have already been taken. <coughs> but I think we all know of GP surgeries. My own GP is one down at the moment, and it will be the next summer before they get a replacement. And, uh, you know, where any, anybody lives, they, they hear stories about the pressures that GP surgeries are under. So my first question, I've got three questions in relation to this. I'll start with the first one, which is always a good place to start. Um, <clears throat> last week, we saw figures comparing net GP income, the share of the contract income that actually goes to the GP personally, 
comparing what happened south of the border with north of the border. And the figures that appeared were that for the latest year available, um, the net GP's income in his or her pocket, as it were, uh, less tax, um, was around £109,000 south of the border, um, but was £89,000 in Scotland. So how big a factor is that in retaining GPs and in recruiting GPs, that differential? So there was, of course, a difference in the number of patients as well. Yes. So, so there was a there was a there, there was a ratio. Um, I think that one of the things, and I, I genuinely don't want to preempt the publication of the the contract for negotiation, yeah. Mr. Neil, because we we want to be respectful of the BMA's position in that. So I think I think the straightforward thing. I should say, is that in the negotiations we've sought to address some of these concerns, but the precise detail will await the publication of the contract. And, and uh, is there evidence that that's one of the factors why we have a, a challenge on retention on recruitment? There is some evidence of that. However, I think the the certainly what I hear, and, and Dr Calder may, may wish to comment, what, what I hear is more a concern about uh, about straightforward pressure on workload um, and you know being able to uh, take time off and being able to give patients who have complex needs the time that they require but Dr Calder would we wish to add to that? I, I, well it, it, it's anecdotal but I have never had a GP say to me if only I could be paid more. Okay. Uh, I have. <laughs> I suppose they're, they're, they are they are talking to me about different uh, right. kids yeah, clinic. Sorry. It's usually it's because they're talking about their patients. Yeah. Okay. The the second question is we heard last week from Tim Davidson of an example, and there are other examples. There was one in Fife a number of years ago. Um, we called it for shorthand the introduction of the Alaska model. Um, and it worked in a GP practice in Fife, um, but unfortunately when the doctor in the practice who was doing it left or retired, the other doctors wouldn't carry on with it, even although the patients and everyone thought the evaluation was very positive. Tim Davidson gave us a similar example of a GP surgery in Edinburgh, which had been under enormous pressure in a deprived area. It didn't name the surgery in evidence last week. Um, and you know, the people were waiting two, three weeks for an appointment that was under so much pressure. And they introduced triaging by a doctor. And uh, so that if somebody had a foot problem, they get referred to a podiatrist, et cetera, et cetera, along the lines outlined by the chief medical officer. And this has been a tremendous success, um, according to both doctors and patients. And the pressure is much, much reduced uh, with the day he visited, he said, actual appointment slots not filled uh, and available for people who needed to see a doctor that particular day. However, he also said that um, the other doctors in Edinburgh, doctor's practices, uh, he said, weren't prepared to introduce a similar system. So two questions. As a matter of urgency, should we not be trying to get GPs to change their work. Part, part, of, part of the solution to this challenge is for GPs to change their work practices. Now, we know the BME has always supported restrictive practices in the past, uh, but they're doing most of the bleating. Is it not time that we, and maybe this is part of the contract that we publish next week, but there's a responsibility, surely, on GP practices, where there's very clear evidence that a kind of change in practice referred to in Fife, Alaska and similarly in this surgery in Edinburgh, it's time for GPs pretty quickly to be more flexible and be prepared to change their work practices and indeed it's in their interest to do so assuming the new contract would not penalise any GP for a reduction in the number of patients they personally saw. Well there is a long question for you Mr. Ray. Which I'll, I'll ask the, You'll the Chief Medical <laughs> Officer to answer. <laughs> Charlie, do you want? Um, so I made reference earlier on to the relationship between the very important relationship between performance and workforce planning. And, and coming back to Mr. Bowman's question, I can assure you that if we see those um, relationships not 
performing in the right kind of way, then we will be interventionist in that space. I think you were asking a question about what, what do you do when it isn't working? And so if I give some examples around seeing boards that don't put forward a, a suggestion around how they want to recruit as part of our international campaign, for example, I will speak to them directly. Um, in, in fact, in respect of NHS Lothian, there have been a number of in, uh, instances where I've intervened to say they need to do something and we've funded particular activities or we've required them to do certain things. Coming back to Mr Neil's point, I'm trying to pick up both of them, um, the points that have been made in, in what was a, a very big question. So, so let me try and unpick various bits well, of it. Big, but the um, question was fairly short. Indeed. Um, <laughs> There, there is a there is a very broad differential in salaries for G GPs in Scotland, and um, the breadth of that chain of that d difference to establish that average is quite considerable. So there are some very high earning general practitioners and some that are not. Uh, of course, there's a mixture of those people who are still operating as independent contractors in the GP model, but there's also a number of salaried GPs and different models emerging. And those, those things are important reflections about how people want to practice and have that relationship between their employer in the wider sense of the, the word or, or, or the people that they provide services to. Where we find evidence that we have got a system that provides a better service for patients, then really our job, I think, is to present that evidence as objectively as we can and seek to remove any barriers that prevent that evidence being adopted. And that's increasingly why some of the regional activity that's taking place, I take your point about regional workforce planning, because we didn't have a regional configuration to the NHS in Scotland until this year, really. So I recognise that, it's in, it, that it's, it's in its embryo. But that active working with the boards, supporting them around transformational change, this year we've allocated funding to all of the regions, relatively modest funding at this stage, but we've allocated funding to them to support that transformational endeavour. I mean that they've got local leadership on the ground, which is really to some extent what that's about, in going and presenting those evi that evidence to say, patients get a better outcome through this model. Let's work with you to remove whatever barriers there might be to the implementation of this model. So in this case, NHS Lothian should be going to all the other practices and saying, look, we have evidence here that this system works much more effectively for both, and it's better for patients and doctors. Ergo, um, we would expect you to, to implement something Similar. And we've got examples of that. So there, there's but, examples of that happening in Aberdeen at the yeah. moment and various other places. Yes, is the short answer. But is that not the problem? We do have examples. We've got examples of excellent practice throughout the health service. I always remember the Western Isles computer pen. Um, and it was introduced very quickly once developed in the Western Isles and produced fantastic effects. But it's taken five years and it's still not you know, spread across the National Health Service in Scotland, there is a real problem in getting good practice, and particularly where it's new, spread across the system. So while there's a lot of good examples of very innovative behaviour, it tends to be in pockets and it tends to be, you know, uh, difficult to get it spread and get the pace of change. It's, a, it's not that it's not happening anywhere in the health service in Scotland. It's the fact that the pace and scale and spread of the change is too often too uh, confined to small pockets. In this case, surely, given the challenges facing the health service in Lothian, the priority should be for NHS Lothian to work with all the other practices to try to get them to do something that is blatantly, uh, you know, very successful. And and does the new contract, without giving anything away, does the new contract? give you the teeth required to make these kind of changes. Uh, and obviously it's a dynamic situation. There'll be other changes during the period of the contract. We don't know what they are yet, but surely we need to be able to ensure that these changes, um, improvements, because we're all about improvement. We're work, it's work, a lot of things are working very well, but we need to improve all the time in the health service, obviously. The contract has to facilitate improvement and itself not be a barrier to improvement, which it might, the current one probably is. I think Mr Neil is trying to answer the question himself, but, but do have a go. <laughs> so I think the contract 
I hope, if accepted, will remove certain of the barriers. Some of these might just be down to basic workload. So in other words, if you don't have time to do anything other than see patients, you don't have time to change anything. I think I wouldn't want to go further than that convener without you know, intruding into what the contract might or might not say. But I, I think the only other point I would make is, ultimately, yes, and I've responded on a couple of occasions to this, we can impose things. However, the likelihood of getting a good outcome if you Agreed. impose something is much less than it is if you get it in by agreement. And that's what the Chief Medical Officer and others are doing through Realistic yeah. Medicine, is promoting, if you like, the principles of Realistic Medicine so that when the practice of realistic medicine comes to fruition, it will be different. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Can I just move on to another issue, which is again related to the availability of GPs. There's clearly a, a, an element of particularly younger GPs going abroad, particularly to Australia. Um, I mean, I was talking to somebody yesterday who had been talking to a recruitment agency who had interviewed 200 GPs in Scotland and 80 of them intend to emigrate to Australia. Is this, I mean, I think this is a, a major le leakage of skills from GPs in Scotland. Is work being done to, and obviously work-life balance and a whole range of things come into this, but clearly I think we should be doing something to try and keep these GPs in Scotland. Now, we wouldn't be able to keep them all. Maybe we should be going to Australia and trying to get some of the ones who've already gone coming back. But it strikes me that's the kind of very specific type of issue that we need to understand so that we know if there's anything we can do about it. There might not be. I don't know if Shirley wants to answer that. I think it may be more sunshine to Scotland. Yeah. First well, come, intervention. Come to, come to Ayrshire, Catherine. <laughs> Maybe maybe allowed to just make a, a slight observation before we get into the meat of that response. I, I was um, in conversation with a, a, a young um, junior doc myself a couple of weeks ago who showed me uh, a photograph of um, an unnamed um, Scottish hospital in the rain and the rather attractive sunshine of the Melbourne a and &E department. And his response to me was, whilst I'm young, I want to go and do some surfing as well. Can you fix the weather? So we need to recognise that we operate in an international marketplace and that our responsibility is to make the roles um, that we have on offer in NHS Scotland as attractive as we can. You touched earlier on about the, um, the importance of salary in that space. For the vast majority of the clinicians that I talk to, that's a part of something. It's not the whole part of something. Um, they want to have good shift patterns, and the DG talked earlier on about the work that we've been doing around improving um, the working lives of junior doctors and various others. They want to have high quality work. Um, we have sitting in the audience at the moment a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow. Um, giving people the opportunity to develop their leadership skills has been something which has been phenomenally successful for us. Um, so we need to improve the attractiveness of everybody's working life in the NHS in Scotland, but not least our doctors, not, simply because of their geographic mobility. There are two things that I would say is that many of them come back. So many of them take the opportunity to go and travel and then come back to practice in Scotland for the rest of their career. And you're absolutely right that we need to do something whilst we're there. So you will have seen, for example, NHS Grampian currently recruiting in Australia and working with people whose um, time there, a couple of years there or whatever it has been, has come to an end and they're thinking about coming home and um, we're actively recruiting overseas to do that. We're also not just doing that by saying, come back and do what you were doing here before. We've got an international training um, arrangement that um, is successful in attracting people from all over the world who can come and train here and spend their time here. And we've got evidence that suggests border agency rules permitting that if they are able to continue to stay in practice where they've trained, a large number of people seek to do that. So you're absolutely right. And my final question, just going back to the plan, the shape and size of any workforce is obviously dependent on the shape and level of demand for the service. 
Um, and if we <coughs> workforce planning is not a perfect science, uh, you'll you'll never get it 100 percent right. Uh, just a fact of life because of all the changes that have already been mentioned. But you'll get it more right if you've got a good understanding of the level and shape of demand of services in the future. And there was a report published, I think, by yourselves uh, or commissioned by yourselves during the summer, for example, that showed that 25 conditions make up for 70% of NHS activity in Scotland. So if you get that 70% right, there's a good chance you know, you're, you're going to hit the, the mark uh, better. So there, there are ways, methodologies that can be employed to improve the accuracy of a forecast. Have you brought together to inform the workforce plan a uh, researched and a evidential um, in one document or number of documents forecast of the level and shape of demand for NHS services in Scotland over the next few years? Um, the short answer is, I mentioned earlier on that we were working with, I think, 79 stakeholders and organisations who provide us with some of that evidence. We've worked closely with um, COSLA, with SOLAS, with agencies such as the Scottish Care um, Association and so on to look at the um, impact that we expect to get from an ageing population, for example. So we're looking particularly at how we support that through um, additional skills around um, care for older people and so on in, in various um, places. Um, it's not complete. It's never, as you say, it's a, an art, not a science. But the, the, the short answer is yes, and we're doing more and we need to do more of that. So if you've got a forecast of the level and shape of demand, is it possible for us to get a, a copy of it? I don't, I don't have a place. That's what I'm saying. We're working with a, a number of stakeholders, but I've got um, some, some stuff that I can certainly share with you about some of the indications that we're working on at the minute, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. That would be helpful. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Good uh, morning. Yeah, it's still morning. Um, the financial outlook for the next three or four years is really bleak. Um, not my words, but Tim Davison, uh, NHS um, Lothian, who was one of our witnesses last week, and he said that was like the one thing, a takeaway message that we should take from him. And he's saying that short-termism and workforce planning hasn't helped. And you know, I think we've kind of realised that today, but he said something that other people hadn't said, and that, that was that we need to raise our gaze and plan beyond austerity. And whether that's at a UK level, here in the Scottish Parliament, or wherever, a growing population with growing health needs will cost more money, and that needs to be addressed fundamentally. Um, his point about austerity, could you, I mean, Mr Gray, you're the, the chief advisor to, to the Scottish Government on, on the NHS alongside uh, other witnesses. What conversations are you having with the, the Scottish Government about this and, and do you, you know, address um, or do you recognise the, the premise of Tim Davison's <coughs> comments? Well, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you're not asking me to tell you what advice I give to ministers because that wouldn't be what I would do in this setting. Um, but uh, let, me, let me address your point uh, briefly. Um, I recognise that the uh, pressure on public services, not just on the health services, the financial pressure is high. There is no doubt about that. That is the case in Scotland, in the rest of the UK and internationally. The um, pressure is growing because of an ageing population, as we've all agreed. But let me tell you about some of the components of what we're doing about that. Realistic medicine is one response to that. The, establish, the proposals to establish a new public health body are another component of what we're doing about that. The workforce planning that we're doing is another component of that. The transformation planning that we're doing is another. Um, can you give me a sense of what it is you're, you're reaching for here? Because as, as I say, I'm not, I'm not about to discuss here the advice I give to ministers. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't expect yeah, you to do that. Um, to go back to the original comment, which was about the financial outlook yeah. for the next few years, is really bleak. And the witnesses were telling us that we shouldn't expect a big increase in numbers in terms of workforce. There's a whole range of things that need to happen in terms of, you know, 
um, redesigning services, training, people working differently, um, multidisciplinary working and so on. But recognising that that financial outlook is very difficult and it's very difficult to, to do affordable workforce planning. Um, Tim Davison, who's NHS Lothian Chief Executive, is saying we need to raise our gaze and plan beyond austerity. And he's talking about, you know, whether it's a UK level or Scottish Parliament level, we all have to kind of get a grip on that. So I just wonder, do you think that his comments are uh, helpful? Is that something people need to look at? And as the most senior person that we can speak to about this today, um, how would you develop that? I mean, he's obviously a senior person in the NHS in Scotland. Um, is he talking sense? So I, I think I, I probably have... Um, a more positive outlook on life uh, generally that's but that and, and and you may say well that's not evidence to the committee what what i would say is as a accountable officer i work within the financial settlement i get i plan within the financial settlement i get i respect the fact that parliament decides on a budget and therefore i work within that that's my job as a public servant i am convinced that we can continue to deliver excellent services within the NHS in Scotland and across the breadth of health and social care. I am equally convinced that transformation is essential to allow us to do that. We cannot simply carry on with a, a plan that, or, or produce a plan that says more, better, faster. That will not work. We, we need to transform, and that's why Shirley and Catherine and others are leading work on different aspects of that. I, I accept that there is financial pressure. I'm, I'm not sitting here pretending that there is not. But I think that if we take the view that with £13 billion, we ought to be able to do something very good indeed for Scotland and for its people, that positive outlook then allows us to plan as Tim says, beyond austerity, if we're, co if we're constantly thinking about the difficulties, we will become absorbed with them. That doesn't mean we can ignore them. We can't. The pressures we've spoken about are real, and they press on individuals, both staff and patients. But I'd like to ask both Catherine and Shirley just to say a little, again, conscious of the convener strictures on time, a little about what we're doing to plan ahead, you know, beyond this year and next and beyond. So, Catherine and then Shirley. I, th I think that, that some of these discussions that we are having here are becoming much more common in, in the clinical workforce, so that that uh, recognition of the, of the austerity and, and that being something that we, we, we have to get through the day job, but we are looking at uh, changing the way people are working, as we've talked about in, in, in many examples. And we also know that we need to talk about uh, what, the, uh, what, the, what the public and what the people of Scotland need from their healthcare services. So many of, of the ambitions of the new public health body will be that, the, that some of this is, pre is prevention. So we know that we can prevent many of the, uh, the ill health that we have ended up treating and will continue to treat. We're also having much more uh, evidence brought forward about the, 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 the children and young people, right back to babies before they're born, about how we can actually influence their health outcomes. So I think we have, we have more evidence about, about what we can do now to, to salvage, if you like, better health for the future. And we have, we have definitely introduced that into, into how we are, are training our staff and also into how we are um, uh, talking about, about public health and preventative spend to some extent, because some of this will need investment now to prevent problems in the future. If I can um, turn that specifically back to a workforce planning question. Um, it takes 15, 20 years to take somebody from joining medical school to becoming a consultant. I don't have the luxury, nor would I seek it, to be able to try and predict what the financial outcome for this year, next year, 10 years' time is going to be. So I try very hard to workforce plan on what I believe the population need will be. 
So I would contend that we are already training numbers in anticipation of life beyond austerity. Because if we weren't, we would be stopping now and saying, oh, we can't afford it, when in fact we're investing more now than we have with more numbers of places in medical school, more number of places in nurse education than we've previously had. Because I, I think, actually, that it's very difficult, coming back to Mr Neil's point about arts and sciences, to say in 10 years' time we'll have a boom as a result of X, therefore we'll need lots and lots. What we need to do is to try and anticipate the needs of our population, to try and take a view on what we believe are going to be the, some of the technological, innovative or teamworking solutions that might be able to provide healthcare in those circumstances and give our best shot at getting ourselves a ready supply pipeline. So my activity at the moment is all about increasing that supply pipeline. And I believe that when we're in a position that we have that supply pipeline in every place that we want, whilst that might cost us more in terms of our establishment, it will save us money in terms of some of the discussions that we've already had about use of bank agency and various other things. So I think Mr Davidson's contention about planning taking the longer view, whether that's about riding the peak of austerity or anything else, taking that longer view is exactly where we need to be and why workforce planning in the NHS is more complicated than it is in some other parts of the world, simply or some other parts of industry, simply because our supply pipeline is so long. When I asked Tim Davison um, just how complex it is to um, achieve these affordable workforce plans on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most challenging, he said 10. And... Um, the, the reasons and the joint submission we got from the witnesses included that there's limited information on the future funding that you receive alongside the Scottish Government requiring you to provide workforce projections for three years. Um, so should it be that difficult? 10 out of 10 is not, not great. I, I don't know how Tim calibrates, but I would take the point that it's that it's a difficult challenge um, and and any long-term planning you have to take into account a number of scenarios and we and we try and do that um, however I would also take the the point that I made myself earlier on that is there are certain things that are best done nationally that can take a view that is not just the view of represented representative chief executives so if if I was reflecting the daily or annual budgetary cycle then um, in the way that chief executives sometimes are required to do then I may not make the long-term investments that we're currently doing you know, it's there's a reason why we do medical the medical school intake at a national level and we take take a view about the long-term sustainable future of the NHS um, Mr Gray, I know that you are a, a positive person and I, I, I hate to be gloomy, but I can't help you sitting here thinking about some of the the real heartbreaking stories that we hear. So I think all of us in this room, you know, we fully admire and appreciate the work that NHS Scotland staff do for all of us every day. But as members of the Scottish Parliament, we do have surgeries and have busy inboxes and we hear about the times when it's not working well. And, you know, to be frank, something that is because of workforce planning issues, because there's not enough people or people are tired and stressed and appointments get cancelled. And, you know, we have constituents who are waiting more than 12 months for operations that, you know, shouldn't take that that long. So I, I spoke to the witnesses last week and I asked, really, is this inevitable? Do we have to say to our constituents that that is inevitable? Because none of us really enjoy having to bring these cases to First Minister questions or portfolio questions. So I know, Mr Gray, because I was there too at the Scottish Health Awards last week where we were celebrating, you know, best practice and exceptional practice in NHS Scotland. But you did have a message to opposition politicians in the room that the next time we have a, an opposition debate on health that we should be singing from the rooftops that we have the best NHS in Scotland. Um, and none of us are here to, to, to criticise the NHS in Scotland. But thinking about those patients and about their outcomes, um, you know, you, you are an optimist, but how can we, when we're speaking to these constituents of ours and their families reassure them that there is a coherent plan it is going to be properly resourced and that 
you know, we're not just going to accept that there's going to be a small percentage of cases where it just doesn't go well. What, what would you say to those people? So what I would say is that that we take serious, very seriously the matter of workforce planning, that we will take seriously any views or recommendations that this committee makes, and that there are cases I know and accept where we don't treat people as quickly or as well as we should. And no, we should not accept that that is merely inevitable. If we are successful, and I I intend that we should be in what we're doing. So through le realistic medicine, ensuring people are not actually over-treated or put on lists for treatment that is not likely to benefit for them, that will then free up space for people who actually do need to be treated to be treated more quickly. If we are successful, as again I intend we should be, in transforming in the ways that we need to transform, and if we are successful in having that conversation with the public through the what we're doing on a new public health body, on population health, about what individuals themselves can do to contribute to their own well-being, then we will see changes. The current situation is difficult, and I'm not denying that, and I'm not enjoining, I, I trust it's clear, I am not enjoining on opposition politicians to suddenly say everything is fine and we should simply um, ignore any issues that exist. O politicians from all parties, those the party of government and opposition, bring to me and to Shirley and to Catherine issues which are of concern to them. That is legitimate and they should continue to do so and under no circumstances would I try to persuade them not to. I am um, grateful to the uh, way in which the con grateful to you for the way in which the contribution of NHS staff is recognised, but I'm not here to say to you that everything is fine and that we should uh, we, we have to accept that there are certain areas in which our performance is not what it should be. Okay, thank you. Just one last point, convener, because I'm conscious that there might be some members of the public who are, who are watching. You never, you never know. And I'm, I'm glad you clarified at a point that was made by another member around, um, you know, inappropriate visits to, to general practitioners. None of us want to put people off getting through the door of, of their GP practice or, or elsewhere. Um, but I raised a, a point last week about the people who don't make those visits, who are harder to reach, and you know. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you won't disagree, but the Auditor General has pointed out that Scotland's health isn't improving and that significant inequalities still remain. And I know you've mentioned, Dr Calderwood, the deep end practices. So, you know, these are the things that we need to look at in terms of innovative practice. But just to be clear, um, you know, NHS Scotland, the message isn't, you know, don't come to your GP. Um, but where we don't have the, the innovative practice in Lanarkshire, there was a, a, a project where um, um, nurseries were, and health visitors were, were going out to visit people who weren't attending the doctor to basically, you know, proactively make sure that they were okay. And I think that project stopped. I'm not sure why. Um, but where we have good practice, like you've mentioned, how can we roll that out? Because yes, there's savings that could be made, but it's also going to help people get better and, and, and try and close this, this gap in terms of health inequalities. So I'll ask Dr Calderwood to say something about that. And, and as I have sought to um, pre <coughs> prevent as far as possible the use of the phrase inappropriate attendance, I'm also on something of a campaign to um, stop us from thinking in terms of hard to reach, because that almost makes it the fault of the person who we're not <coughs> reaching. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the responsibility is with us to reach them, not for them to find some way of getting to us if we make it difficult. So one of the things we are doing is trying, is engaging with local communities to understand what it is would motivate people to come into contact with a health professional. It doesn't need to be a GP. Sometimes it's not even a health professional. It may be someone to, to provide advocacy services for them and support. But Dr Calderwood can say more about that. So, so I think that one of the, the successes of the deep end practices is those are embedded in communities and, and understand them. The uh, Links Worker Programme, I don't know if you're familiar with it, I think has, has really made a, a big difference in a short period of time. This is where people are um, employed to make the links between benefits and, and 
all sorts of different services that may, may be the GP, but also others. And where people actually are coming with a, with a problem that isn't uh, solvable by health. I think we also are understanding further our health literacy in Scotland. The statistics are, are not uh, easy to listen to. So 23% of working age adults don't, uh, wouldn't be able to calculate the dose of paracetamol for a child from the instructions on the bottle. And 38% of working age adults don't fully understand the bowel screening leaflet that advises them to come forward on their 50th birthday. 4%, 1 in 25, have no health literacy at all. That means that they don't understand what your kidneys are, what they do, and why that would be important if, if there was a problem. And uh, NHS Tayside, for example, have really em embraced some of these figures and are, are working with community groups. This isn't about necessarily literacy and numeracy, in fact. It's much more about the, un the understanding of, of what, why it is important to come forward. Uh, and I think that some of our health inequalities are, are based on some of, of those levels and also some of our messaging. And I've spoken publicly about this because we are, again, claiming that people are hard to reach and actually are, it's our messages that, that aren't uh, being understood or in fact even getting there. So our, our medical schools have really taken this on board and I, I again, this is a work in progress, but, but up until this point, I don't think people really understood that, that some of the, uh, we're working away trying to get people to come to us when they don't realize there's something wrong. And I talk about the, the worried well, but more importantly, the unworried unwell. Uh, and and there, are, there are schemes, workshops, pieces of work, some of it's through is, is education, much of it is beyond health, and I think really understanding our deprived communities in Scotland uh, better is what where, is where we need to start. Thank you. Okay, one final question before I let you all escape. Um, the National Workforce Plan that you published in 2017 doesn't include details on expected workforce costs associated with NHS reform. Um, what progress have you made in establishing those costs, and can you share that with us today? Could you, could you be a bit more specific about Okay, so, so take one example of this. You, you, we've spent a bit of time talking about, um, you know, stories about changes that people have made, additional training, so you have a multi-skilled workforce. All of that costs money. I want to know if you've thought about how much that costs and whether you've actually built it into the plan because the plan didn't mention it. As, as you'll be aware, the um, commitment to a national workforce plan is part of our transformational change delivery programme. Um, we had um, the opportunity to work to create some regional leads for that. I think those were the chief executives largely that you saw last week. Those regional leads have been working to produce plans that will have that transformational component within it. We've um, seen the start of some initial drafts of those plans now um, with the commitment that those plans should be available for publication by the end of this financial year and we can do the consultation thereafter. Um, those transformational plans will have a service change element where that's, where that's appropriate but it will also have regional workforce plans associated with them that will start to help us identify costs and so on. Where we're looking specifically at clinical therapies, so some of the stuff that Catherine's been leading on around realistic medicine and various other changes to practice, then we're starting to get um, responses back from CMO and CNO about some of the training costs that might be associated with those. We have that global figure. Well, the commitment that we've made is to revisit the, the National Workforce Plan next spring, and at next spring that should be part of that plan. So the, the, will there be a budget bid in this budget that you will be making through health for additional money for this? Or do we see the figure in spring and we wait another year before anything happens? No, we, we were, I mentioned earlier on that we were allocated some transformational funding for this year. Most of that uh, has been de deployed in building some capacity for doing some of that work at okay. regional level. I'm expecting us to have some budget allocation for that next year too. You'll understand that at the moment budgets are not yet set, so we're in the process of discussing that.
Okay, but what you've described is, is money to buy capacity to actually formulate what the costs are. What I'm looking for is what's the money that's going to make a difference on the ground? If I, if I have described it as simply as buying capacity, then that's, that's a, a, a not precisely what I wanted to talk about. Some of that has built capacity. Some of it is funding initiatives. So some of it is funding. We were asked a question earlier on about digital some of it is working in that, you will get a budgeted um, assessment of transformational costs as part of the um, work that we would expect to be able to publish okay. next spring. I think, I think what would be helpful is just rather than if you can't provide me with the cost, just the process so mm. that we as a committee are clear about when we'll see a figure and how that's built into the, the budget. Okay. On the basis that there are no other questions, from committee members. Can I thank you very much for your attendance this morning at the committee and can I now move the committee into private session? Thank you.